What's up, guys? Hey, Ben. How you doing? You're talking to Jim Norton and uh, Louis J. Gomez. Matt is in Florida with his family. How's it going? I'm doing well. Where are you right now? Are you in Milwaukee? Yep, I'm in Milwaukee. I mean, just outside Milwaukee, but yeah. Okay, and how did you get hooked up with uh, with one? How long did you fight for those guys? One championship? Are we live on the interview? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I uh, I actually went on a trip to Singapore in 2012, and I met Chaudhry. Um, and we kind of hit it off, and then obviously uh, I had the free agent negotiation period in 2013, and uh, I ended up over in one, and I was there for four years. Now, did you live over there at all, or were you still coming back I, to Milwaukee? No, I didn't. I didn't live over there. Um, I have a family, so that would have been really hard. Uh, I would spend about two to three weeks at a time over there. I'm a couple times it was even more if I had to do like a press tour or something. Um, so I got to see. Uh, a lot of Asia. My family got to go a few times. Um, it was a really good experience. When you're when you're fighting there, are you thinking in the back of your mind at all? Like, I would love to get in the UFC. I mean, because there's, there's there's such a, a great viewership there too. I mean, that that's a huge huge uh, company. So you, it's not like there was nobody watching you fight. Yeah, no, they have a uh, man. Their, their platform is gigantic. Um, I really enjoyed my time there, and so. Uh, well, you know what? In my, in my life, and uh, most people, if they want to be happy, you deal with the here and the now, right? You, you don't deal with um, all those hypotheticals of what could happen or where you could be or anything else. If uh, You know, if you tend to do that, your life's going to be pretty miserable. I mean, sure. think about it. Like, what if you have a wife and you're like, well, if I just had that lady as my wife, I would be so much better off, right? Because I'm not going to be happy. Yes, but uh, I mean, that's probably no, what I'll do I, if I, I get do. married, though. <laughs> I'm gonna, I deal with the here and the now. Yeah, well, I, I mean, how big of a show was one FC? Because that's something that's sort of lost on us. I feel like because UFC is obviously the big show. We've watched you fight in Bellator, but did it feel like you were fighting in this huge thing while you were there? Yeah, no, it, it's really big. Um, so you know, the, obviously, Americans are very American centric. There's four billion people in two time zones over there between Japan, China, Korea, India, all, all you know, everything that's encompassed over there in Asia. Um, and I never fought in less than a sold-out arena. I mean, they were selling out Mall of Asia Arena, 20,000 seats. Uh, the arena in Singapore, 15,000 seats. So, yeah, I, I mean, every single time I fought, it was a sold-out arena. It was a huge show. It was, it was a really big deal. Um, you know, when I was out on the streets, everyone recognized me. It was, uh, it, it's almost uh, otherworldly, right? Being, you know, I come from Milwaukee, and then I go to Shanghai, and, Everyone stopped me asking to take a picture. It's like, whoa, 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 how did this break happen? This is really bizarre. And they must have really, uh, you know, because in Asia they have a real appreciation for martial arts and fighting styles. So over there they must have, like in Brazil they appreciate the jiu-jitsu a lot of times. Things that they'll boo in Vegas because two guys are on the ground for a little while, they'll, they'll actually appreciate when you're in Brazil. So it must have been that way in Asia. Um, you know what? They actually they don't have as much of an understanding of jiu-jitsu and, and wrestling uh, there's not really, Japan's pretty strong wrestling. Any other strong wrestling uh, countries over there? And so, uh, you know, that was that was a little bit lost. And if you want, kind of watch their fights, there's not a lot of strong wrestlers in, in that organization. Um, but, man, the fan, you know, what I was always told when I went over there, because I was a pretty big thing in the 90s, when, when you go over there, the fans are going to be quiet. And I think that is really specific just to Japan because, I never experienced that. It always felt like a normal, loud, rowdy crowd every single time I fought. Um, now, what is your relationship with Tyron? I mean, because uh, you said you would never fight Tyron Woodley. Yes. Yeah, um, well, of course. I mean, we were uh, I, mean, I, I was close friends since 18 when I went to college. He was, uh, what, a sophomore, maybe, or something like that. And uh, we were team captains together for a couple years at Missouri. Um, and then we, you know, we've remained close ever since then, uh, you know, all the way to, he does a lot of his training camps here in Milwaukee and I spend a lot of time training with him. And so, yeah, just, uh, I always say it's like, I have all these dudes I don't like, what's the point in fighting him? Yeah. He does, uh, but by the way, I don't know if you know, Jim, but Greg Warren, um, Greg Warren, yeah, Greg baby, Warren. that's a Mizzou wrestler right there. Yeah, they they were. Were you guys team? I I I interview a very very long time ago, and Tyron Woodley a very long time ago. Ba with ba uh, Greg Warren hooked me up with your contact, and he's a great comic from New York. Um, and uh, what, did you guys wrestle together on the same team? How what was that? Who Greg? Yeah. 
Greg, I don't want me. I'm not gonna time him out or nothing. But Greg's a few years older than us. No, no, I know he is. I, know. I was gonna say, how did how did the connection come? Yeah, because he wasn't your coach, right? Well, how, how did he know you guys? No, Greg would just he would just come around, you know. And there was a, there was a comedy club in Columbia called Deja Vu, and so you know he would stop in twice a year when he was in St. Louis or whatever. Um, he did some fundraising stuff for. He would come by and do comedy, and he was just, you know I mean the wrestling programs are really tight knit. It's, you know, the alumni come back and you, you see him around. So, um, obviously, he's a, he's a super awesome guy. So, everyone likes him. And, um, yeah, so we just got to kind of know him through that. And then, when I was like, he travels so much. We, you know, I'll just like, randomly, he was like in my small town in Wisconsin like a year ago. And, you know, we went out and got lunch or dinner or whatever it was. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, the relationship with Tyron, though, but what do you do there? I mean, you're, you're obviously coming in with this monumental deal. They traded, you know, um, Demetrius, Demetrius who's, a, you know, been with the company forever, one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. You're undefeated. There's so much value. Uh, you're coming in, making a lot of noise in the division, calling out a lot of people. People are very excited to watch you fight. But what is the what's the end result here? There might be a time where they put that title shot right in front of you. Um, are you hoping that your friend loses, or are you willing to move up, or are you willing no, to move down? No, I hope my friend loses. That, that's idiotic. <laughs> uh, I, th- I think there's a whole bunch of things that can happen here that don't include me fighting Tyron. Um, you know, number one, if I just get to be with a bunch of these jackasses that are in the welterweight division, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy and I make a lot of money, so my life's great. Uh, if GSP comes back, I love that. If they make 65 and 75, I love that. If I fight to be their catch weight, I love that. Um, so, man, I, I got a lot of options. Yeah, I mean, you look at, like, uh, I think DC has said the one guy he would never fight is Kane at heavyweight. So a lot of guys have that one guy that they just don't ever want to have to go up against. <laughs> Uh, and I know Robbie Lawler has been spoken about uh, for you. Uh, I think Dana did confirm that, but the UFC has not made the announcement. So I guess you are yeah. fighting Lawler. I, be- I believe I. I'm not really sure why they have not made the announcement. I, as far as far as I know, um, yeah, it's, it's a done deal. Uh, do you have any idea when and where you guys are fighting? Yes, yeah, January 26th in Anaheim. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, obviously, Colby Covington is probably next in line for a shot at Tyron. He probably should be because he had the interim belt. I know you guys don't uh, particularly like each other. And, and he said about you, he said you were, you know, he calls everybody a virgin. Um, I know, it's, it's a really bad gimmick because they're mm-hmm. able to like you. It, it, is, it is kind of silly. Um, but if he, if he wins, I mean, would you, uh, after one or two fights, be, uh, you'd probably like to get a shot at him? Shot, I'd get the shot right away. But he's not beating Tyron, so I mean, we might as well not talk about stupid hypotheticals. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's just it, impossible. That's just not happening. I mean, is that something that's sort of uh, how how close do you feel as if the UFC would give you a title shot? Because with Robbie Lawler being a former champion, legend in the sport, I mean, it seems like yeah. they're if I giving beat Robbie you- and and Tyron were to tear his ACL and MCL and his Achilles and then fall over and somehow Colby won by injury before the fight even started or something. Um, you know, if, if something like that would happen, because Colby's not being tired, let's just be clear about that, um, then yeah, I, w- I would be next to fight Colby, obviously. Um, that yeah, That's just such a simple fight to make. I beat him up easy, I make fun of him, and everybody's happy. How so? Uh, for I mean, essentially, you're talking about a lot of uh, other opportunities, a lot of other fights. How important is UFC gold to you? Is that something that's like a huge goal of yours, or, or are you just trying to, you know, make the most out of the opportunity with the UFC? Uh, I was going to say, like my answer from earlier, if it, if it happens, it happens. If I get the opportunity, great. Um, but uh, I, there's a lot of things I think I can do to prove how good I am with, without having that opportunity. And uh, the welterweight in, in, over in one is a 185, so you're going to be... Well, yeah, they do it a little different. So you can't cut water weight over there. Um, so when, when you weigh in, you just do both uh, on the scale and you have to do a hydration test. And so, uh, I, honestly, I think that's the way everybody should go. I think it's super fair. I think it's probably the best way to do it. Um, so when they did that, when they went to that system, they just bumped... Everybody in the organization went up a weight class. So if you fight at 185 over there and you're not cutting water weight, what, what do you walk yeah. around about normally, like a week or two before the fight? So I, uh, my walk around weight for weighing 170 uh, and my walk around weight for making their 185 was the exact same. I'd oh. walk around between 183 and 185. Uh, and really, uh, I do the last, in the last 24 hours, I cut that. 
uh, that 13 to 15 pounds of water weight. I cut that in the last 24 hours. And so it was literally not no change for me, except I didn't have to do the miserable water weight cut for the last 24 hours. And how much of a detriment do you feel like that? Going into the ring when you have to do that crazy cut, how much of that do you feel affects your performance in the cage? Well, it, it's, it's actually a benefit to me because... I'm tougher than everyone else, and I'm more disciplined than them. So I'm going to do the weight cut right. I'm going to do it effectively, and I'm going to perform really well. Most other people are going to do something stupid and dumb. And so it's going to be a net. It's actually going to be a net negative to me, but I think it's probably the most fair way to do it. So that's how they should do it. When, when is the last time you had to cut that much weight? Um, well, they, when did they institute the water weight policy? I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe, maybe two years ago? Okay. Whatever they, I, can, I don't recall when they instituted it, um, but it was because, uh, yeah. So maybe two, maybe two years ish. Okay, so you have you have no problem, you know, cutting down and then and then bulking back up day of the fight. Well, no, no, it's just water weight. It's really simple. Um, okay, I'm going to throw out a couple of names. Now you mentioned it could be possibly at a catch weight. Dana has said that there's no plans to create a 165. Um, do you think that's sure. true? Uh, I don't know. Find out. But you're willing to do it? Well, I mean, whatever it is, you can't trust everything Dana says. I mean, if we literally, <laughs> Dana said women are never fighting the UFC. I mean, right? I mean, can we really believe everything he says? Come on. Well, that's my next question. Okay. Uh, are you uh, still blocked? Yeah, that's exactly it. Did, <laughs> did Dana finally unblock you? Uh, he, it, t- it took a while, but yes, he did. What did he block you for? What did you say to him that he blocked you for? Uh, frankly, I, I don't even recall. I mean, the, the initial argument between myself and him, which was kind of the start of everything, was that um, he said you couldn't do drug testing. It's impossible. You can't do it. And I said, well, there's actually this organization called USADA who tests all Olympic athletes all over the world. So it's, that, it, it's 100% possible. There's, I mean, if you do want to count all the Olympic sports, there's significantly more athletes than that than there is in the UFC. Mm. And now the, the obvious issue is it costs a lot of money to do that. And so, well, let's just be honest. Let's just say, hey, I don't want to do it because it costs too much, which is, that's the truth. Um, but instead, he called me a bunch of names. And I think, it, I think that was the start of it. And so, obviously, now we're, what, six years removed from that. And there's, um, uh, the USADA is alive and well. And I think it's made the USADA, uh, the UFC, a much safer and much more fair place. Uh, and so I'm very happy that it was instituted. And um, Demetrius obviously goes over there. You come over here. How did you first hear about this? Was this something that got floated and then you're like, that's ridiculous, that'll never happen? Or was this something that was really close to being done by the time uh, you even spoke about it? No, they asked, hey, they said, hey, can, are you okay with this? I said, yeah, of course, but is that like, that's not very realistic. That's not going to happen, you know? And then they call me back like three weeks later and said, oh, yeah, it's done. I'm like, uh, seriously? Like, you guys, you guys aren't just messing with me? And then, uh, you know, I'm going to take a few more weeks to get the paperwork done and get the announcement done. So, uh, but very, very exciting, awesome, something I didn't think would ever happen. So I don't think, I don't think it was on anyone's radar, to tell you the truth. You have an opportunity to become, you know, one of the biggest fighters in the world because you have, a, you know, a huge fan base in Asia. Um, and now you're going to come to the UFC and get the exposure through the UFC. Um, I was talking to Bisping about this. I did a uh, podcast with Michael Bisping, and there's a couple guys that are out there right now that are undefeated, that are high, high, high level guys. Where it's sort of it's been a while since we've seen that. Usually, when guys get to this level, um, they've they've dealt with a, a few losses. Are there nerves coming into the UFC because of what is perceived as the obvious jump in, in competition um, and, and the guys you're going to be fighting now? Or is there any sort of, or is this another day at the office? No, it's, a, it's another day at the office. No, no, one who, um, no one who changes the way they perform based on the crowd ever does very well. And so peak, peak performance, uh, you know, you guys are comedians, whether, whether you're doing a, uh, a show for your buddies or you're doing a show for 5,000 people, um, if you say, "Oh my God, there's five thousand people out there," you're gonna you're gonna perform like shit. And so, uh, you know, the the same thing goes for fighting. You know, it, it, regardless, there's one person in the octagon. It's not like I gotta, it's not like I'm gonna beat up three people now, right? It's the same thing. It's me and another person locked in the octagon. I gotta go beat them up. Um, so it's literally the exact same thing. And so, no, it's, uh, business as usual. I'm gonna go and execute the game plan that I'm planning on doing. 
You know, I mean, Robbie Lawler likes to stand up and, and throw. I mean, everybody knows he's one of the toughest guys uh, in the UFC. Uh, that, that's, I, think, I think you're a tougher matchup for Robbie Lawler. Um, but, you know, you get guys also like Kamara Usman or Damian Maya. I, I think would be very interesting matchups with you, uh, which I, I would love to see you fight one of those guys if, if Robbie uh, goes well for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, and obviously, you know, that uh, Maya is kind of, I, I enjoyed watching him because it was so interesting how he just kept implementing his style and it worked. But now uh, it did end up catching up to him because I do believe he has uh, three straight losses. So, um, but regardless, I, I respect the skill set. It's good. I just think that, um, you know, I actually had to be, I actually had to be Damian Maya when Tyron was getting ready for him. I was mocking and mimicking his style. And it was really frustrating because he, he's, he doesn't change it up. He does the same thing over and over and over again. That kind of caught up to him. But then with Usman, he's fighting RGA. Um, uh, I think coming up here, like real quick, yeah. maybe like a couple weeks. And so, you know, obviously if, uh, if he beats RGA, he's going to be vaulted into that upper echelon conversation. So, yeah. So I, I guess I am not here uh, to pick my opponents. I'm here to beat people up. Do you think that you mentioned Maya? Because I've noticed that watching him fight too. Is as great as he is, it does seem like he was kind of doing the same thing. And I and I stuck up for Tyron after that fight. I didn't think he got enough credit for stuffing. What was it? Twenty six consecutive takedown yeah. attempts against one of the best yeah. jujitsu guys he to ever fought fight. A perfect fight, basically. I mean, and people kind of gave him shit about it. But it's like, yeah. why? How are you well, doing? Well, I mean, somebody- he tore he tore his labrum in the first round, so he can only throw punches with one hand. Also, so you know that that often is kind of brushed under the rug as well. I mean. So not only did he stuff every single takedown, but he won the fight standing up with one hand. Do you think that uh, after a while, kind of people kind of figured out how to beat Damian Maya? Uh, I mean, you, you obviously have to have uh, a very specific skill set, which means you're good at wrestling, and that's you know, obviously Tyron kind of showed everyone the game plan, um, and then after that, Colby and our, uh, Usman were able to execute on the game plan that, that Tyron had kind of laid out for beating. Who who is most the most exciting matchup for you outside of Robbie Lawler? Period. Forget everything else. Just who's the most exciting? If you could pick, and I know you said already you don't pick and choose your opponents. Khabib. 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 Yeah, because it's uh it's two guys who do the exact same thing who are both very 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 good at it, and people want to know who's the best at it, and it's just, so it's, I think that's a very intriguing matchup for many reasons. Uh, Especially the stare down with your hair and his, you know, uh, hat. Ah, he's copying me. <laughs> so, and and you think that would have to be done at one uh, one sixty five? Yeah, I can't. Well, I mean, I, I could do it wherever he wants. I just can't make one fifty five. I mean, so I made one sixty three was my Olympic wrestling weight, and that was um, I was on a very strict diet almost year round for that. So I, I I don't really I couldn't foresee myself going any lower than that. That was kind of like really challenging for me to maintain that weight. Uh, but with the, way, with the way wrestling was set up at the time, the weight class above that was 189. And so obviously you can see that that's like a huge jump from 163 to 189. So I had to really, I had to commit to making 163, but 55 is definitely out of the question. And uh, now did you grow up in Milwaukee? Where did you grow up? Yes, I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, I was at Milwaukee and then I was gone for Roughly ten years, and now uh, I'm back. Did you now? Did you always want to fight or make your living somehow uh, wrestling, or was that just something you did and then got an yeah. opportunity and it became your life? I thought I was going to be a wrestler. I thought I was going to be a wrestling coach. I mean, fine. When I was a grown up, fighting didn't exist, and it, it wasn't thing you do to make a living. You know, it was the thing the bad kids did on the playground. Yeah, that's what I hear a lot from guys who. Um who grew up wrestling. First of all, I hear it's the toughest thing in the world. Like, you know, uh, comparatively, talk about that a little bit. Compare wrestling training to training as a professional mixed martial artist. Um, Well, I I think the thing that is, you know, so much more challenging is um, you have to make weight all the time, right? Uh, I mean, if you're in high school, college, you get 20 times over the course of uh, a few months. Um, And then, you know, on top of that is, say, in a college wrestling room, you're competing with, you know, 30, 40 guys in the same room who are all very, very high level at what they do. And you don't really see that. They almost know. I mean, really, there's no there's no MMA camp that has as many skilled guys as, say, like uh, Penn State, Ohio State, Missouri, uh, Oklahoma State. And so they, you're not getting that day-in, day-out competition. Um, 
and, and that's kind of you know their, their daily grind. And that's what makes so many wrestlers so tough, um, just mentally durable. That serves them so well once they move over to fighting. You know, Justin Gaethje came in. Uh, he was undefeated. I want to say he was fifteen and zero or fourteen and zero when he came in. And I, he won his first fight, and he was, was in, he was kind of put up in the top five or six immediately. Even the fights he's lost, he's been very competitive and he's fun to watch. So, I mean, obviously you're undefeated, you're 18-0-1. If you win this fight against Lawler, the, you're probably going to be in a position to be maybe one or two fights away from a championship uh, shot. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. I really didn't expect much. You know, I just kind of made a... No, no, it's an interview. I should have asked you a question. I just kind of made a statement, and you're like, okay, yeah, I've either, I fucking heard you. <laughs> oh, yeah, the sky is blue, the grass is green, Jim. No, no, but I'm just so interested in the fact that him and Tyron are close, and yeah. it's like that could happen a lot before. So maybe, like you said, if you're willing to fight, could be a bit of catch weight or do something like that to kind of avoid having to go against the guy. But if you're next in line for something like that... like Yeah, but Khabib doesn't want none of that heat. What you know? The the reality is, think about this. Where is it, you know, that is a it's a really tough fight for Khabib. It's a bigger guy who does what he does, undefeated. Yeah. It's an uphill battle for Khabib. So unless you had a title or there was maybe a hundred and sixty five pound title on the line, I wouldn't. If I would be a title shot, sure. If I'm Khabib's manager, I'm saying no fucking way. There's no way. There's there's sure. almost no benefit except for possibly handing you that title. Yeah, I well, I agree completely. Well, yeah, he's also, I mean, he's got to fight Tony Ferguson next, and then maybe Connor, or maybe not Connor. But, I mean, obviously, you and him would be a big money fight, and I'm, I'm sure he wants big money fight. I but mean, there are also fights yeah. that, and, I'm, and you'd mentioned yeah. GSP, oh. which I think is a great fight, Ben. But there are other fights out there as well that are almost like the level of title shots in, in themselves in terms of what they do for you. Obviously, Conor McGregor, obviously GSP. Nick Diaz just came back. I know you had mentioned, you, you had given a comment on Nick Diaz. How do you feel about Nick Diaz coming back? Are you a fan? Would you like to fight him one day? Yeah, let's go. I'm ready. I'm ready. Like I said, all comers. I'll, I'll, I'll beat them all up. Do you feel any, and again, the, the fact is you're coming in uh, highly uh, regarded and highly thought of coming to UFC. A lot of guys come into the UFC quietly and they win a couple of fights and they build a reputation. You're kind of coming in already more famous than a lot of guys in the UFC. Uh, does that make you feel more confident or was there any additional pressure with that? Uh, I, you know, I don't think that the number of followers I have has anything to do with how good I am at fighting, although I think I'm good at fighting and I do have a lot of followers. Uh, so I, th I think it'll help, it'll help my ascendancy to a uh, title fighter to get those bigger fighters because I know UFC pays attention to those metrics, whether uh, that's, that's warranted or not. Um, you know, I'm more of a, I guess it's a pure competitive, like I enjoy the competitive aspect of it. Um, but people enjoy my personality. They enjoy that I tell the truth. They enjoy that I, I speak plainly and I don't beat around the bush and that I'm really just genuine. Like, you know, I don't have any bad to say about Robbie Lawler. So I'm not, I'm not going to fraudulently come up with something bad to say about him that to fight him. Right. Not, you know, I'm going to say if I, if I don't like Colby and I don't, I'm going to say it. If I think Nick Diaz is a dumb dumb, I'm going to say it, but I'm not going to, um, just create some kind of, uh, uh, unnecessary beef just because I'm fighting someone. Uh, you know, so I think people appreciate all those things, uh, about me. Yeah, it's a combination of being, of saying, you know, obviously the right things and saying what people like to hear, but also being somewhat genuine. And you see the guys that do it that are a little bit more contrived, and then you see the other guys. I think another part of it as well is I think every man in the world can connect with the guy who doesn't back down. And when you and Dana White had that public beef, I think everyone just went, hey, you know what? Even though everyone, I love Dana White. I'm a huge fan of Dana White and what he's done for the sport. But... Everyone kind of goes, you know what, dude? I wish I could tell my boss or my potential boss to go fuck himself. And <laughs> that, that thing, everyone Bingo. goes, yeah, good for you, Ben. Yes, absolutely. And then, you know what else? They, they I mean, for the, when it initially happened, he was kind of telling a lot of lies about me. And, you know, some people bought into it or didn't buy into it. Um, but then as, as time wore on, um, it was just, it was unavoidable the fact that I was very, very skilled and good at what I do and that there was really no other reason that I didn't get uh, a shot at, in 2013 uh, besides the fact that uh, for whatever reason, and I, I'm still not really sure, that he didn't like me at that point in time. And you're, I think you're right, too, about being just being yourself and being honest because when it's manufactured... It doesn't feel good to hear. It doesn't feel menacing when a guy manufactures shit. Like, Chael Sonnen felt, like, legit. 
You know, or when Derek Lewis says something, it feels like it's really coming from Derek Lewis. It doesn't yeah. feel yeah. made up. Um, so Absolutely. the fact that you're genuine and you're and you're just an honest person, I mean, that works as well as somebody who talks shit. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, like, I mean, one of the reasons that Colby's not really catching on, and if you look, Colby's been in the UFC for four years. He had uh, a fake title shot, and he still <laughs> has a very, very small amount of the following that I do, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter or, or whatever, right? And, and part of the reason that happens is because um, it's so contrived. You can just tell, like, when Colby says stuff, you don't really, like, think, wow, that's unique, that's genuine. It's like, oh, okay, someone wrote those freaking lines for him. Mm -hmm. This guy's a dumb dumb. He's just, he's literally trying to say, like, like the fact that he has to, he has to bring Trump into everything because everyone gets mad, either they love or hate Trump, right? Right. But he said he has to try to do that to draw interest. It's just such an obvious sign that people aren't really that into you. Well, he, what he does is he plays into troll culture, and he's essentially a troll. And look, I also appreciate what Colby does because, at the very least, he's fucking trying. I think there's a lot of guys who are complacent. <laughs> you know, when the microphone he's trying, he's just not very good at it. Right, <laughs> I agree. I think he's executing the. Ex he's not. He's trying to go for what guys like Connor and Bisping and Tito Ortiz have done before him, and done naturally, yeah. and done naturally, and been very good at it. And he, it's just he comes off as a tryhard. And that's yeah. something that I think people are having a hard time connecting with. I think you're right. Hey, guys, I got to run. I got to take my kid up from school. I appreciate the interview. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, good and, talking uh, to you, man. Uh, good luck against, uh, against Robbie Lawler, and we're really happy you're in the UFC, and we're really happy we finally get to see you fight here, man. And, and uh, good luck. We'll yes, talk to you sir. again. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right, take care, Ben. Yeah, he's a he's a good dude. He's a really good guy. I wanted to ask him too about the uh, it was a good question was about uh, if he had a relationship with Demetrius, but if he's got to take his kid somewhere, yeah, what am I gonna do? You tell Ben Askren what to do? No, it's all good. Yeah, do you have a relationship with Demetrius. He's sitting in my kid's car seat right now. <laughs> actually, 